Good, good afternoon, everybody. This is uh, Chris Winslow, Director for Ohio Sea Grant and OSU Stone Laboratory. Thank you for joining us today for our two-hour web webinar related to harmful algal blooms in Lake Erie, the 2017 forecast. Um, all the participants uh, that are logged into the webinar are, are muted, um, but please, if you have any questions, you can type into the chat function. And after all the speakers are done, um, we will be synthesizing those questions and reading them aloud to the panel of speakers to, to reply. Um, so as you can see from our opening slide that's on, on your screen, um, we'll have a talk from Dr. Laura Johnson about loading. Um, then we'll turn to Rick Stump from NOAA that will give us uh, the HAB forecast. And then we also have a series of speakers um, in no particular order there. We'll actually be moving some of those around um, as we get moving through here. But you can see that we'll have four different speaker, speakers after that. Dr. Huntley from University of Toledo, Stu Ludson from Ohio State University, Greg Labarge with Ohio State University Extension, and then Melinda Huntley comes to us, comes to us from the Ohio Travel Association. Um, just quick introductions. Again, we, we had a press briefing uh, early this morning to talk about the, the forecast, and it was a very well-attended event. We had probably a dozen and a half media personnel. We had a, a, about eight or nine elected officials in the room. And I'm in a room right now at uh, Ohio State University Stone Lab where there's a bunch of content experts also sitting here in the room, scientists that are currently working on nutrient loading and, and harmful algal blooms. So I don't want to steal the time from our, our speakers, so I'm going to give introductions. I'll introduce them one at a time. And then at the end of the uh, series of talks, we'll open it up for um, some Q&A. Q &A. And so the first speaker that we'll, we'll bring up today for you is Dr. Laura Johnson. Um, she's with the National Center for Water Quality Research at Heidelberg University. So Laura, if you want to come on up. Do I click my left mouse? click whenever you want to advance? Oh, okay. I can do that. Okay. Hello, everyone. So, uh, I'm here to talk about what has happened in the Maumee River since March 1st, and I am a future a fortune teller, right, or a psychic, so I'll tell you what's going to happen to the end of July, too, right? <laughs> All right. Great. So, I first wanted to start talking about where we are actually sampling. So, we sample the Maumee River at uh, Waterville in Ohio. You can see it on the map here. It's one of 18 sampling locations uh, throughout Ohio, and we have one in Michigan where we're collecting water samples. And soon, we're going to add some more stations. So there are going to be more like 23 sampling stations throughout uh, Ohio and Michigan. At each one of these stations, we have an automated sampler that's right by the river, collects samples three times a day. Um, we analyze all three samples if the flow is up or if water is turbid. Otherwise, it's one sample a day. This occurs year-round, each one of these stations. And then every week, our lab techs go out and collect the samples uh, for analysis in the laboratory. We've been sampling in the Maumee River since 1974 using this, basically this approach. And we analyze for more than just phosphorus, although all I'm going to talk about today is phosphorus. So, you know, alas, that's what happens. But if you're interested in other major nutrients, sediments, we even measure some herbicides and pesticides at the Maumee River as well. And I include the little USGS icon there because otherwise I'll forget to mention that um, each one of the stations where we collect water samples is also a USGS gauging station. So they get flow, we do water quality, we need the both of them to be able to calculate their load. And before I even show you any data, once again, I'm just going to make sure we're all speaking the same language here. So I'm going to show you some information on total phosphorus. That's like if you took that Erlenmeyer flask out and collected a water sample, probably today it would look about that muddy. You good? Okay. And, uh, and, um, and so we have the phosphorus that's attached to the particles as well as that is in the water. You can filter, filter out all the particulates on that piece of filter paper. The water that makes it through contains dissolved phosphorus. The particles that get trapped are the particulate phosphorus. And I'm talking about this because we also have a new metric where, which we call total bioavailable phosphorus. So essentially that is the portion of phosphorus that is available for algae to use, right? So some of the particulates are hard for algae to use. Only about 25% of it is available. And then the portion that doesn't settle out before you get to the lake from where we monitor. That ends up being about 8% of those particulates. So I want to uh, first go into a little bit about the different metrics that we're going to be talking about and why we look at them all. The first is that you know, we know that the load of phosphorus, which is that metric tons of phosphorus that comes out of the mummy from 
you know, our time period is March 1st through the end of July, is entirely dependent upon just the volume of water that came out of the Maumee River. We call, I call it discharge. You can think it's just water volume. It's uh, versus over some period of time. So I use kilometers cubed, but that's over spring. Um, the concentration of, that's also uh, dependent upon the concentration of phosphorus in that water. Uh, you know, you need them both. Uh, we call that flow weighted mean concentration. I'll get in that a little bit in a minute. Oh, I don't know if I'll have my animations on here. So anyway, nonetheless, you can imagine that if we have the Maumee River here as a spigot going into our bucket, which is Lake Erie, you know, over the spring time period, you know, that, that bucket will be filled up. Imagine I had an animation before that was a little tiny little spigot with very clean water. That's what it would be like during low flow periods. We know that the way the Maumee River works, because it's based off of land runoff, that when it floods, we tend to get a lot of flow and a lot of concentration all at once. That's how we understand the river. And it turns Lake Erie into something, oops, that's the wrong thing, that looks a little bit more like this, right? And then that flow weighted mean concentration, that mean concentration that you think about, is essentially if we captured all of that water over the springtime period, both the low flow and the high flow, and you measured that concentration from that bucket, right? So it's a complicated term. It's easy to understand if you think of Lake Erie in that term. So I want to first start with precipitation and what we saw over the spring, because I'm starting off talking so much about water in general and, and not necessarily getting into the phosphorus yet. So for those of you in the audience who can't see the, the title slide, it says this is precipitation from March 1st through the end of May, how the uh, Midwest Regional Climate Center breaks up their spring. And you can see on the one side is just accumulated precipitation, so it's the total number of inches. Over this period of time, you're somewhere around, you know, 15 inches for most of the area. The other side shows the percent of a long-term mean. So you can see that we were pretty much close to normal for parts of the watershed, a little bit above normal for other parts. Indiana was quite a bit above normal. If we look at just June, we got another about five inches of rain throughout the area. However, as a percent of the mean, it was kind of around normal. Some areas like in Michigan are even below normal. And then we have July. Oh, July's been wonderful, right? Uh, so in July, we have gotten another five inches of rain. And in some areas of the Western Lake Erie Basin, you can see that little pink spot is like 400% of the long-term average that we have here. So we've had an awful lot of rain. If you note the date here, this doesn't include what we just got overnight. So if we turn this into flow, this is a figure that shows the discharge um, from 1st of March through the end of July, or through July 12th. I know, yeah, that's right, um, which is projected a little bit for, for July 12th because it was after I already made the figure. Um, and you can see we essentially had six major storm events. You can count them up. Two of them are kind of together. We're in the middle of the sixth one right now. If you turn that into a cumulative discharge where you add each discharge together over each day and you watch how it accumulates over time, you can see on the red line here that what was really interesting in terms of flow is in March, we really didn't get any accumulation of flow at all. It was lower than any of the past years that I show on this figure. Um, and that's because we had a very warm winter. We came out in winter and the soils were fairly dry, so when it rained, we didn't get very much runoff. There was some rain in March, just didn't generate a whole lot of runoff. And so it took until we got to April where we had some back-to-back -back storms to saturate the soil, and then we got a pretty good increase there. You can see we had a lot of those big rain events in May really accumulate a lot of flow, and we're just at the, the starting point of the increases in flow that we'll have for July. So I expect this number to bump up, you know, a little bit after today. And then if we compare this to our long-term trends, so we can take these cumulative plots and, and turn them into bar charts and we'll go back in time a little bit farther. You can see this, uh, the, the flow that we had so far in terms of cubic kilometers is very similar to where our running five-year average is. So we're kind of around average, not as high yet as 2015 or 2011, not as low as last year or 2012, but fairly similar to a lot of the past years going back to about 2008. Keep trying to hit the wrong button. <laughs> so don't hit the wrong button. <laughs> right. 
Okay, so um, this is showing dissolved reactive phosphorus. And, you know, I basically plotted on the one side versus the flow that we had. And I really just wanted to make the point here that, you know, we see an increase in concentration with every storm event. This is a classic non-point source type diagram where we're showing that when, the way we get phosphorus into water is by rain going over land, land runoff. Uh, the exact opposite of that is what I have here is supposed to pop in, and that is showing a classic point source. The Cuyahoga River is all driven by point sources, and there the dissolved phosphorus doesn't change with storm events. It's from a past year. I, I cheated because I didn't want to make a new figure. But you know, the dissolved phosphorus doesn't change with storm events, or if anything, it goes down when we have a storm event. And that's pretty typical of that. So just emphasizing that we got big increases with every storm came from land runoff. If we look at that with the cumulative load now, then you can really see how low March was relative to past years. Um, you can see the red line was fairly low here. Um, April had a pretty big bump up, but most of our loading has come through May. We've had a little bit so far in July, but no, you know, given the delay in terms of our, um, you know, getting our water sampled, we don't have anything of these most recent storm events yet. Total phosphorus shows the same type of trend. It increases with every storm event. Total phosphorus is coming from land runoff and the watershed. Um, but what I think is interesting here is that if you look at our peak concentrations, even with May being such a big storm event, they tend to decrease over the season. And this is something that we've kind of known for a little while. One way to look at that is to look at 2011 versus 2015 on the cumulative load plot. It was flipped the other way around for dissolved phosphorus. Um, and that's because depending on where in the season we get the rain, it'll influence how, um, how much loading we get of the particulate phosphorus. So we see that decrease here. You can see then the April accumulation was much bigger than what we saw with DRP because it was in April. It was easier for that rain to generate more runoff. Lots that came in in May, and we're getting a little bit here yet in July. So if we look at these all together, this is total phosphorus and dissolved reactive phosphorus. Uh, these are long-term trends here. For, um, for total phosphorus, you can see we're a little bit above what the five-year running average is, but it's not extreme in any means for now. Um, that's probably going to go up a little bit, but probably not a whole lot by now. Um, dissolved reactive phosphorus is also very similar to you know, what we've kind of seen since 2008 not as extreme as 2015. But with the dissolved reactive phosphorus, you can see that increase in the, in the loading since the mid-90s. You guys know I usually show these plots going all the way back to the 70s, but I thought I'd zoom in this time to switch things up on you. Okay, so what I think is also really interesting here is I, I put discharge back in here because over the past 10 years, it really shows that the patterns that we see from discharge are mirrored in DRP and total phosphorus. You know, it really tells us that it seems like it's water volume and rain that's driving all the patterns we're seeing in loading, which means, remember the second part of loading that's important, it means that concentrations have not changed all that much. So these are concentrations of total phosphorus DRP, and now I have total bioavailable phosphorus in here, because I'm going to show that to you in a minute. The solid line is the 10-year average of all of those points. And what you see is that in 2017 so far, our mean concentrations are around average, right? Um, total phosphorus is a little higher than normal. I think that has to do with some of the timing of the rain that we got in April. Um, and I have some other theories there, but um, I haven't, don't have any evidence for those yet. What you don't see is a very strong downward trend, and you don't see that we're hovering around the Annex 4 targets yet, which would be awfully nice if we were if we were there, then we wouldn't be expecting much of a bloom, right? Um, so concentrations haven't changed. That's why discharge, TP, DRP, total bioavailable phosphorus can all tell us a whole lot about what we get to expect. Um, but we use the total bioavailable phosphorus to tell us about the forecast, at least for NOAA's version. And that's what we then also use in the early season projections and give the ranges for in terms of what we're expecting through the end of the season. So that's what I'm showing here. The first plot is a bar chart of the total um, loading that we have so far this year. It gets up to July 10th, which was Monday, if I remember correctly. Might have been Tuesday. That was Monday, right? 
it was Monday, okay. Um, and we're at 411 metric tons. So that puts us over, uh, you know, the 2014 as well as 2008. There's still a bit more to go there. Um, so the cumulative plot shows pretty much what you've seen before, very similar to dissolved reactive phosphorus, but now we've got the ranges at the end there. What we expect to see by July 31st for total bioavailable phosphorus loading is somewhere between 465 to 530 metric tons. Uh, to put that in perspective, our Annex 4 target would be about 240 tons. CRP is 352 to 402. Um, you know, the, the target there is 186. And the total phosphorus is, you know, up to maybe 2,000 metric tons. And our target there, if I remember correctly, is 860. So we're definitely above all those targets, but we have a very rainy year and a 40% reduction is what we're looking for anyway. So with that, I wanted to make a couple of announcements. The first one is that we have a new web page. Uh, there's a screenshot of it right here. Uh, so if you need any information or you want to get in touch with any of us, check out our webpage. It's not totally perfectly up to date yet. We're still working on it. And by we, I mean primarily me and one other person. So it takes a little time, but we've got a lot of information up there so far. Um, if you wanted to know about why we're seeing the trends we're seeing and that sort of thing, a little history on the lab and so on and so forth, we're still running LakeUrieAlgae.com. So check that out if you want to see a video of me saying a lot of things for another five minutes or so. And then the final thing that's exciting is we are pretty much finished with um, yeah. we're pretty much finished with a, an up to date web page to put our data into Gloss, which you can see here. If you do do a Google search for uh, Gloss Mommy Tracker, it should pop up, and you can see that. Uh, this shows essentially the same cumulative plots that I showed before, but here you can choose what metric you want to look at, and you can, because oh, I have a, a pointer here, you can choose what metric, and you can also choose what years you might want to compare to. And this is something moving forward we're going to try and keep up to date. So anytime you want to go and check out the up-to-date data, you don't have to dig through your old um, email, right? So with that, I think that is all I have. I can't even push it forward anymore. Thank you, Laura. Yeah. So we'll, uh, we're, we're having staff is uh, collecting all the questions that are coming in, so we'll ask those at the end of the event. Um, so right now we're going to call up our next speaker who's going to give us our NOAA HAPS forecast. So I'd like to introduce Dr. Rick Stump, and he was um, with uh, uh, National Center for Coastal Ocean Science with, with NOAA. So Rick, please take it on over. Thanks. All right. Thank you, Chris. Um, great to be back here at uh, Stone Lab. Uh, the, the forecast. Uh, Overall, it's, it's an ensemble that we do with models from several groups. And um, the key data input, of course, is the, the phosphorus load that all the models depend on. And Laura described that so well, and that's a critical piece. Without that, we would not be able to do this. Various models come from Limnotech, uh, University of Michigan, and NC State University, and then also Stanford and Carnegie Institution. So there's a, a set of different that are ensembled together overall. So we're getting started. Left mouse click. Oh, mouse click. Yeah, oh, mouse, <laughs> mouse. Yes, yeah, not arrows. Mouse. Ah, excellent. Okay, and cursor. Good. Okay. So what I'll start off with is is last year, and we we've been doing a forecast for several years. And so what happened last year for the bloom, and how did the forecast go? Uh, to put a context. 2015 was the worst bloom we had seen, the most extensive bloom in the lake. Severity index, which would set in after with 2011, which at the time had been the most extensive bloom, 2011 being a 10 on the severity index, 2015 was 10.5. And that came out, for those who don't recall, is uh, the June that year was the fourth highest discharge of any month ever observed on the Maumee River, not just of June. So June and July 2015 were huge loads, which ended out, we didn't expect records, and so that kind of bumps us up on the scale uh, to the 10.5. Coming off of that in 2016, uh, much smaller bloom, quite mild, um, and we can see the, the overall scale of how much uh, smaller an area was covered, uh, very little and low concentration creeping into the central basin, and relatively little areas of, of 
high concentration. In the scale bar, the warm colors, the, the reds are quite high um, microcystis concentration. And if you're down in this blue and dark blue, those are, are while it's present, fairly low concentrations. And you'll see the similar uh, display through out most of the rest. Uh, how the forecast works. Left mouse. have to hide the uh, All right. Okay. So uh, the, the bloom was uh, 3.2 severity in 2016. Our forecast of the ensemble is 5.5. The bloom was clearly much smaller in 2015, which we did forecast, but it was also smaller than the actual forecast that we made, the ensemble and model. So the question for both of those is, is why? Well, the simple part is, why was the bloom smaller in 2016 and 15? Very straightforward answer. There was a whole lot less bioavailable phosphorus in 2016. Less bioavailable phosphorus, smaller bloom. Very straightforward, just the spring load. The second part, why were the models overestimating the bloom size? Well, just about all the models include an internal load of phosphorus and much more than actually occurred. So you may ask, what is internal load of phosphorus? Well, there's internal load and external load. External load is the Maumee River, water coming in from outside the lake, coming in from rivers and tributaries and so forth. Internal load is, is actually phosphorus that's stored in the sediments in the bottom of the lake that are then released into the lake over time. And there is a small amount of that. Um, uh, Tom Bridgman, University of Toledo, has worked out that it's, they, their estimate recently is about 7 to 10 percent of the total phosphorus available is probably internal load. Um, in our case, with our models, we included a carryover phosphorus from the record 2015. We'd seen 2011 to 2012, and 2012, in the very mild year, there's still a slight bloom, and we estimated about 100 to 150 metric tons of phosphorus was needed to extent, account for that bloom. So we thought that the same phenomenon might occur from 2015 to 2016. Huge bloom in 2015 leads some phosphorus in the lake, and so we built that into the model. And that clearly was incorrect. There was almost no, there was very little internal load. So that was that an assumption that, that we have to be careful on. Another component is um, the Lemnotech model, which involves some numerical calculations, thought had growth starting a little earlier. And so their model was predicting a little larger bloom as well for because of the earlier growth. But once you use up all the phosphorus, the bloom stops because it is inherently phosphorus limited. There's only so much phosphorus. You can't, you can't make phosphorus if it's not present. Key part out of this, though, is this, this fact that the, this carryover load or internal load, this phosphorus out of the sediments is not important, points to the simple message. It's the load from the tributaries, the load from the Maumee River that matters. We get that under control, and we will reduce the, um, the, the blooms. So we reduce that overall phosphorus. OK, a little sidetrack here. Um, I can't quite read the first line. It's uh, Sentinel-3A, at least people in the room. I think people on the web can read it. Uh, we're adding a new satellite, the first satellite, a new satellite we've added to this since we started doing the bulletins or in 2009. This was just launched last year by the European Space Agency. And the European Union has what's called the Copernicus Project. And Copernicus Project is a series of satellites that are observing the Earth, all sorts of things, land, vegetation, ice, uh, the oceans, ocean temperature, ocean altimetry, and very important for us, water color, ocean color, lake color, water color. And that's the, the instrument on, on the Sentinel-3. Uh, we had actually used. Uh, uh, a precursor sensor, Maris, that uh, from 2009 to 2011, when we did a bulletin, and a lot of the data actually we, we showed from that time was available. That satellite failed in 2012. And we're getting that through agreements NOAA has with uh, UMETSAT, the European Union Meteorological Satellite Program. So, so the question is, okay, what does this offer? The instrument called the Ocean Land Color Instrument, uh, OLCHI, um, and uh, I should add that European Space Agency runs it. It's based in Italy. And anyone who knows Italian consonants, O-L-C-I is pronounced O-C, not O-C. Uh, if it was so, that's the, the shorthand. Uh, 
It's a new technology. We've been using the MODIS instrument. NASA launched on Terranaqua. One is 17 years old and the other is 15 years old. That's 1990s technology. It's extraordinary. I mean, NASA makes great stuff. These satellites will last that long and run well. But they are old. They're not quite as young as they used to be. And they're, uh, they're losing a little. So it's more accurate, less noisy than those instruments. The resolution's better, 300 meter pixels versus one kilometer pixels. That means we could see a bloom that's one-tenth the size of a bloom with MODIS. And there's a continuity program. I should say there's two more satellites. They've actually committed to three more satellites. Um, and, um, but Sentinel 3B, 3C, and 3D will gradually go up over the next decade. And that's a huge part, meaning we have a long-term guarantee. So when our 17 and 15-year-old satellites finally fail, we've got, we've got the next one up. And then the next mission NASA's planning, the PACE mission, will have even greater sensitivity to pick up these blooms, and so then it will be compatible with it as well. The only trade-off with LG is it's not as frequent yet as MODIS. MODIS with two satellites, we get up to two, some days we get two images in the morning and the afternoon, but we typically get at least one a day. With LG, we're every two to three days with the one satellite, but later this year they're going to launch Sentinel-3B, so it will be by potentially next summer we're going to see one every day with the LG coverage keep the MODIS as well. And just to capture the difference, so you can see what it makes when you're less noisy and more sensitive. This is actually Sandusky Bay in the islands. Um, Sandusky Bay here. Actually, Toledo, the Maumee River is here. Uh, this is just last week. And you can see what a dramatic difference it makes when you have a better instrument. The uh, true color MODIS has a couple of higher resolution bands just to capture true color. So those look pretty similar on screen. But we can see cr very crisply the bloom. There's also none of this, this noise that we're picking up from Otis doesn't show up. And also because Olchi has more bands, notice the Maumee River, the high sediment load, it's showing up as a apparent bloom, and we're not picking it up with the Olchi data. So without any editing or manipulation of data, we'll have this. So it'll really help us interpret the MODIS data, and we'll also be able to use that as well. This is a big help in, in improving the data set. And I put that back up to the top. Little arrow. How many left or right? Oh, pages. Yep, there you go. Okay, so, so we have a new satellite. Great. Now let's get to the forecast. We do an ensemble of five models. The models can go from numerical to what are statistical climatological models. Uh, I'm not going to read through this whole slide because either you know exactly what we're talking about here or you're not going to care um, one way or the other. But they're the different sources, the different approaches, they all capture a little difference on how they weight the month, how they do the computation. Uh, but probably a key part is um, they're, they have different assumptions. The, I will say the Lemnotech model is quite numerical. The others are statistical overall. And so we have the, uh, the total bioavailable phosphorus, which goes into several R models. We have three of them. And uh, this is what Laura showed and, and the range overall. And you can see where 2017 falls in. Clearly a wet May and a wet July coming into this. And of course, they are less than, let me just step back here a minute. Those loads are less than 2011 and 2017. Uh, forecast. This is all the, the last uh, 16 years of data and the forecast for this year. And we're looking at a 7.5 on our severity scale. Again, 2011 is a 10, 2015 is 10.5. This puts us very close to 2013, which was, has been the third worst bloom, the third most severe bloom we had seen. Um, and worse than, and it's more uh, severe bloom than 2014 as well. The, the range of likelihood are the models themselves, and the circles show those ranges. Um, they all, they all, their uncertainties capture each other, so we have a good confidence that what, what um, the ranges that we get out of these models, that they are matching up quite well. Uh, back up to that page number. 
Now, with those models, what are the similarities and differences? Important thing is they all have uncertainties. We, we don't know exactly what each model, we can't exactly capture what information. Um, you know, we're, we're looking at past and we don't have every term down perfectly well. So the uncertainty, or you might think of it as an error estimation, but they all overlap, so they are consistent in the results. The low end versus the high end of the models on these ranges between six and, in fact, if I can go back, um, the low end of the uh, uncertainty is six, the higher is uh, about 9.5, and the model range from six, six to eight, seven. Those all have to do with, it's interesting how the arrows work. Ah, all right. Uh, they treat the internal loading, you know, that loading I mentioned coming out of the lake, each one of them treated differently or very little. There's also treatment of different months, a little different, how July particularly is, is approached. There's a little different weighting put on the July load, on some a little more and some less. And then the timing has started to loan. But there are no other assumptions, no carryover from last year or any of that sort of thing going on in the forecast. Put a context in this if we're talking about, say, 2013 or 2014. These are the past blooms at their peaks, and you can see that, of course, 2015 to 2011 had huge areas of what are the, the, the warmest colors, the, the yellows and reds um, overall, um, the most extensive area. In 2013, which was a, a at its peak, there was a strong area of, of bloom within the western basin, but um, it did not go outside the western basin, in, well, a little bit outside, but not much. So, big difference. Um, now, a big question people have is toxicity. We estimate the biomass. We do not yet have the ability to forecast how toxic a bloom will be. And we're also trying to work on being able to forecast the change in toxicity over time. So it's important to understand that the blooms have different levels of toxicity. What I call toxin density, that's how much toxin is in each cell, how toxic are the individual cells. So if you have the same amount of bloom, 2014 would have been far more, talk, almost four times more toxic than the same amount of bloom in 2015. 2015 needs four times the amount of biomass as 2014 in order to be toxic. And 16 was also low. So one of the questions on Toledo, the fact that part of the problem was it was a, quite a toxic bloom, and it started quite early as a very toxic bloom, and that's part of the reason why that occurred. There's now enough instrumentation and capabilities that um, we will know whether there's a bloom there, and Toledo is they're, they're going on the assumption that it's toxic overall. Important point with all of these, we've not seen this bloom. The bloom always produces some level of microcystin toxin. That means the scums, which concentrate very, concentrate the bloom, concentrate the toxin. So I cannot emphasize enough, if there's scums, stay out of the water, and if you have a dog, keep it out of the water. In the United States, every year, several dogs die from swimming in microcystis bloom. And so we don't want anyone losing their pets for that reason. Um, so, and um, if there is not a scum in the area and there's low bloom, the lake will be, can be safe to, to swim in or to use. Uh, another context, if we're talking about a year like 2013, which was, which was a, a year with a severe, fairly severe bloom, what does this mean? Well, some of the worst of it didn't reach the island. Uh, if you're out of Middle Bass or um, Island, there was relatively little bloom. And as a dramatic point of view, um, I don't know if any people who participated in the Perry, the, the, battle, the battle of Cape Erie bicentennial, but an image there, and if you look down at that water and it's not green and full of gross lawn, people had a lot of fun boating. You can use Lake Erie even when you have a bloom like this. People need, you, you need to keep that in mind. And also, the blooms move around. This is an example from two different years um, where they, we, we can only say in general right now where the bloom will be. Um, we forecast going out, I'll touch on the bulletin shortly. But for example, looking at these two years, in 2010 it was mostly up on the Michigan shore and actually well up into the Central Bay, whereas in 2008, yes, it was closer to the Ohio shore. Uh, and kind of a shorthand on this is if you have a southwest wind, Ontario has a problem. If you have a northeast wind, Ohio and Michigan, Ohio has a problem. And if you have a south, um, yeah, 
and a northeast wind, Ohio has the problem, and if it's a southeast wind, it's Michigan. And so those wind patterns change, and there's a prevailing one, but it varies a lot. If the winds turn calm, you get a lot of scum. You have a windy time, it's well mixed and diluted through the water column. So this all changes, but huge differences in here. You can have a, a great time and just knowing if you know where it is. That gets us to the bulletin. The, uh, this is now the ninth year for the NOAA um, Lake Erie Hat Bulletin, Mark Hoggleblum Bulletin. And until now, it has been experimental, and this was last year's. And the bulletin gives uh, from satellite imagery where the bloom is and does a forecast of where it will be going out three days, done twice a week. Big change this year is it's now an official NOAA product. It is no longer experimental. It's now an operational um, product in general. And so um, that means we have the opportunity to do the re more research in order to improve the actual forecast and what we're doing with this. This is a great advance. Um, another aspect to this many people don't realize, it goes out as a PDF. And by the way, anyone can subscribe to the bulletin. It's as simple as it's no cost. You just sign up with an email address. And the PDF file is actually GeoPDF. And if you go and when you open it up in your Acrobat reader and you go to tools, there's this analysis tool. And you look down and there's something called geospatial, anal geospatial analysis. You just click that box, move your cursor in there, and you get a latitude and longitude. So if you're a boater, you wonder where the edge of that bloom is, like right here. That's a latitude 40.7, longitude 83.2. You want to be east of that. Put that in your GPS and go. And this is included for the forecast. So you're looking at what looks like just a printed page. But one of these obscure things about uh, Acro uh, PDF is that does a lot more than we realize it does. So we're trying to make it as, as friendly as possible. One, uh, lot, uh, one other point, uh, a lot of question about the reductions, proposed reductions of the uh, Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement and the proposed 40% phosphorus reduction. If that were implemented, the goal is to get a bloom that's below about a severity of three. And most years we would see that, including this year, we would see what would be a relatively mild bloom. There'd still be something present. It would not get rid of all, like the 2011 and 2015 blooms, but they would be reduced substantially. So this is potentially where it would be if we had, um, if we actually met those targets now. Um, so what I'll capture now in summary, we're looking at a, a bloom this year, small, definitely smaller in 2011, 2015, but potentially matching 2013, which was the third um, most severe we've observed. Uh, and of course, it will be larger than last year's mild bloom. Um, usually it develops from west to east in the western basin, um, and this recent rains can put a lot of sediment in from the Maumee River, and it's algae. It needs light to grow, so we may actually see it starting more in the center of the western basin, and, and then gradually moves eastward as the sediment settles out. It starts somewhere between late July, early August. The last few years, the blooms have tended to start more in July, uh, late July rather than in August and we're, we don't quite understand that starting time, but um, that's the potential it might start, we might start seeing it uh, in within two weeks. Uh, but typically, it will, we'll start seeing evidence of it later. It does not all appear instantaneously. I can't emphasize that enough. It starts and expands, so it slowly grows. This is not a fast-growing organism. It takes about a day or two to, to a day or two to double in number, so it doesn't instantly appear. This is not, you know, this is not science fiction space movie. It slowly grows and gets bigger. Um, can't, again, much of the lake will be fine most of the time. This is the western basin. The central basin and the eastern basin will not see this unless you get a very strong easterly wind. Might it show up in part of the central basin? And even in the western basin, depending on how the winds blow, uh, again, if we have a southwest wind and you're here in Ohio, it may be out past West Sister Island. You may not see it here. It could vary quite a bit on that location. And finally, to get information, to get the bulletin, we've got two websites here. Um, if those are webinar, you can do a screen capture right now and uh, get these locations. But tidesandcurrents.noaa.gov has their link for it, or Coastal Science. And some other sources, uh, GLOSS, data GLOSS, that US slash portal, that has a whole variety of HAPS data, including uh, Laura Johnson's um, uh, phosphorus data. 
know is Glarolab also has water quality. And then if you're looking for health or other toxin information for the state of Ohio, you can go to Ohio EPA for information for them and their parks. That covers this part. And then we have a we have a momentary extra point on the NOAA side about where we're going with the operations. And uh, Rick, while we're transferring over to that, there was a question that came in uh, that I was just loaded up. On one of your slides, it says that the range goes to 9.5, but in the bulletin that some people have in their hands now that are listening on the webinar, it says it ranges to 9. Uh, is there a clarification on whether it's, it can range out to a 9 or a 9.5? Uh, the 9.5 is the more correct number at this point. Okay. 9.5? Yeah, we had an update. Um, Anyone in Ohio will notice it rained uh, last <laughs> week. It not only rained last night, but it rained last weekend. So we we were updating the models, and so that's uh, a slight discrepancy there. Okay, but right. this this is the more correct number. Good. I say that one because that was automatically generated rather than hands to change as the press release. Good to know. And then and, and Rick's going to carry on through uh, and, and, and present the, the slides that we have for Karen Cavanaugh, who's here with uh, us from Have Co-ops. Uh, but to help with the transition, Rick's going to carry us through two or three slides here. Right. So as anyone can guess, this is not Karen Cavanaugh speaking. Uh, <laughs> and uh, um, uh, uh, the she's a co-ops, the Center for Operational Ocean Graduate Products and Services. They do a whole range of operational work. Uh, actually, in the Great Lakes, they do. Uh, the water level water level stations in the Great Lakes, and there's also anyone who uses the models for uh, predicting lake levels, um, and those models are run out of co-ops. So there's there are they're already involved in the Great Lakes, and this is adding one more to to the toolkit that they're using. Whoops, going too fast. All right, so to have. Harp Lago Bloom Bulletin, which you saw a subset, it's issued during the bloom. It'd be twice twice a week, and provides the analysis of where the bloom is and a forecast movement. There's an image, a satellite image of the distribution lake, and also a very similar looking one that gives the forecast going out three days. There's also other information like the currents, which you would see here, and also the wind patterns overall. And the winds actually show the probability of mixing. The mixing is particularly useful if you're a boater because if there's no mixing forecast and there's a bloom, the likelihood you're going to have scum, it's going to be very high. And this is actually color coded. So if you have mixing, it's red. And if there's no mixing, it's green. And if you're interested in things on the bottom, water treatment plants tend to be more interested in mixed because the bloom ends out down in the water column. So it's um, anytime we see it in the, I should say, in the satellite imagery beautifully well, it was a boater's problem. And if we don't see it so well, it's actually a treatment plant problem. It's the opposite of what people might expect. But the key thing is the bulletin is going out, will be transitioned. It's an operational forecast system. And that issued, will be issued twice a week um, once the bloom starts up. And anyone who's a subscriber would have already seen this particular bulletin, actually, um, now. And this again. And the, uh, and co-ops has been involved with this in other, in actually in the Gulf of Mexico. There's Gulf of Mexico Red Tide in Florida and Texas started in 2004, doing bulletins down there to provide information, particularly to the managers, but also for the public on some of the respiratory irritation. So this is an expansion of this capability. So now now has three operational harmful algal bloom um, uh, forecast systems in place: Florida, Texas, and now Lake Erie. And the it overall, this, this assures that there's a long-term commitment. Um, it's not dependent. I'm in a research group, and so we can go back to doing research in order to improve this, to try to understand it better and make and help people respond to the blooms much better. It also assures that, uh, you know, if I ever decide that I'd rather do something else and work at NOAA, it will continue to run. And uh, a, a robust infrastructure, part of the whole transition, everything stable, operational, and continued routine evaluation. So this is a this is an important contribution for for the community up here. And here's this these websites you would have seen this is the tides and currents website, and you can actually get the current bulletin. And if you have any questions, there's an email address have at noaa.gov. We'll go to people to if there's key questions or information on this. Thank you, Rick. So as we uh, get up and transfer to our uh, next speaker, what we're going to do for the next four talks are really uh, 
I'll give you examples of great work and the research that's going on um, around this issue. So we've got the loading information, and then Noah and, and, and Rick take that information to give you a forecast. So now we know we're talking about a 7.5 with a range about that number. We want to talk about some, some great research and efforts that are going on um, between our academic institutions in close conjunction with our state agencies. So the first speaker is actually not in the room with us now. It's, it's Dr. Stu Ludson. And he's, gonna, uh, he's actually out of the state at a conference. He's a keynote speaker. So he's got a tiny window of time here that he can give us a talk before he's got to go on and give a keynote address. His co-authors are in the room. Uh, Jay Martin's with us today. So if there's any questions relative to the next talk you're going to hear, we can still field those talks um, at the end. Uh, so Jay, we're going to, or I'm sorry, Stu, we're going to turn it over to you. Can you, uh, can we hear you? Yep. Can you hear me okay? Seeing nods in the back room. Good. So we can hear you okay. And uh, let's just make sure you can advance the slides too. Uh, let's see here. So the custom animations aren't working perfectly, so, but it's okay. Um, I can't go back, there we go. Okay, um, I'll, I'll work with this here. So uh, good afternoon everybody, thank you Chris. Um, today what I wanna do is tell you a little bit about a recently completed Ohio Department of Higher Education project that sought to help state agencies better understand the risks associated with um, consuming fish that were captured during the har um, harmful algal bloom season in Lake Erie. And so in addition to acknowledging um, the Ohio Department of Higher Education, I, I do want to acknowledge um, Manju Manubolo, who's a postdoc in my lab. He's the one who's um, developed the methods that you're going to see and hear a little bit about and also has done a, the majority of this work. In terms of um, just some background, I think Rick did a pretty good job of, of just giving some um, good context here, but we, we know the lake's becoming more eutrophic over the past decade or so, and these cyanobacteria blooms have become in, uh, more frequent and more severe. These blooms are, I get a little delay on my end, sorry. Um, these blooms are a little, um, are problematic because they threaten uh, many ecosystem services that the lake provides. So these include things like clean and, and potable water, um, beaches that can be used for recreational um, activities like swimming, and then in turn you can have reduced tourism and property values associated with the aesthetic properties of these blooms. Where I want to focus my effort today is mostly on, um, on the cyanotoxins or the toxins that are associated with these blooms. Um, and as you can see from the, the top bullet on the slide, there's a variety of um, kinds of toxins that are produced, some that target the liver, others the nervous system, the skin, and, and then you have more general ones. The toxin I'm going to focus on and talk a lot about today is microcystin. So this is what we call a hepatotoxin or a liver toxin, and it's, it's the most uh, abundant toxin worldwide and, and pretty common in Lake Erie and other Ohio water bodies like Grand Lake St. Mary's. At present, we've um, found about 140 different kinds of, of microcystin variants. Um, and these, these microcystins are, as I sort of mentioned earlier, important because this particular one can lead to liver, can liver, liver cancer and liver necrosis, um, even at low doses. And then at high doses, you can actually get mortality. And I know Rick just talked about dogs dying, but you could actually see deaths in humans due to uh, liver failure associated with um, being exposed to too much microcystin. And this is something that's been, it's been do um, documented in Brazil. These microcystins are a problem because they're a highly stable um, set of molecules, um, and so you can't just simply boil or cook away the microcystin. It actually only serves to concentrate the toxin. And so because of this stability um, of this toxin, they can, these toxins can accumulate in aquatic organisms, including fish, if they actually consume other organisms that have toxin in their, in their body tissues, or these toxins could be taken up um, through the gills. And so that sort of begs this question of, um, do sufficient microcystins accumulate in the tissues of fish that are out there and captured during the cyanobacteria season, and, and do these, do these um, fish, if you eat them, pose a risk to humans? And one of the fundamental needs or limitations that existed um, at least a couple years ago was uh, a way to actually quantify and measure these toxins reliably in fish. And so that's what I want to talk a little bit about today. So the Ohio Department of Higher Education has funded um, two projects that are pretty similar in some ways. Both um, have two general goals to them. So we've got two, 
two, uh, and I apologize, normally I build my slides, but the, the WebEx isn't letting me do that. So you have two projects that were, were funded. They both have these general project goals. The first um, general goal is to develop a, a new way to measure microcystins in fish tissues. So we had a project that was funded from 2015 to just uh, ended this past uh, spring that was looking to develop this technique called ultra-performance liquid chromatography tandem mass spectrometry, or, or UPLC MSMS. Um, and that just wrapped up, and I'll talk a little bit about that today. And then we have a, a second project, and, and I should say that that project is, is its goal is to target individual variants of microcystin. So a microcystin LR or an RR or Y are these different forms. So we get very congener specific outputs. The second project that's underway right now and will wrap up next year is actually looking to develop a way to quantify total microcystin. So you get a single value, but it's the summation of all the toxins that are out there. So you get a conservative esti um, estimate of toxins available in fish. And so with those methods then, the second part of both projects was actually use those methods to measure microcystins in Lake Erie, walleye, and yellow perch um, before, during, and after the cyanobacteria season. And so today what I want to do is talk a little bit about this project that just uh, wrapped up, talk a little bit about what we did in terms of methods to quantify toxins, and then secondly, use those methods to actually tell you what toxin levels were like in walleye and yellow perch that were captured during 2015. And then I'll just provide a few take home messages. So there's the schematic for today. If we look at the, um, the general procedure for uh, measuring microcystins in fish, there's, there's four just general steps. The first is you need to collect those samples from a lake. So Lake Erie, for example, you then take those fish and you have to start to begin to break down the fish so that you can expose the toxins to, so that they can be analyzed. And so the first step in that is just simply homogenizing the fish tissue. So essentially you take these fish, you put them in a big blender, and you create a, a milkshake of, of fish. And it's very akin to what Jim Belushi used to do back in the, um, with, his, with his bassomatic from Saturday Night, Saturday Night Live skits, if you're old enough to remember any of that stuff. So you get this sort of milkshake slurry of, um, of, of fish tissues, and then we can actually go down and further try to extract these, these toxins um, from the fish tissues using a whole bunch of solvents and then other um, types of, of methods like sending sound waves, really high frequency sound waves into, into the slurry to, to further break up these, these cells and release these toxins, and then ultimately that um, extract of, of toxins will be in solution and you can bring it into the mass spec and then actually measure them and detect them using um, a mass spec. In terms of the extraction procedure, there's three general steps to it, and this is where I'm going to focus is on this extraction procedure here because this is the, this, it poses a couple big challenges here. So the first part of the extraction procedure is essentially just spike it with a known amount of microcystin. So this is pretty straightforward. You just put in known doses of microcystin LR or RR at high and low concentrations, and then we can actually use that to see how well do our methods recover known levels of microcystin um, in the sample. So that's pretty straightforward, but the two challenging components are the next two phases. And, and, and so you have this phase of the extraction where you take the homogenate and you're really trying to break up the cells to, and break up some of these bonds to free microcystins so that they can actually be eventually detected later. So that's pretty challenging because some of the bonds that exist um, um, with the microcystins are tough to break. And so that's challenge one is getting the microcystin out of the cells and out of the tissues. And then the second challenge deals with something called sample cleanup on the bottom here. And essentially what we're trying to do there is, is now that we have microcystins in a solution, there's all these other potential molecules and materials that are, are not microcystin that we have to filter out and remove because those other materials that might be in solution could either interfe interfere with our ability to actually detect microcystin using the mass spec or the molecules might confuse our mass spec and have the same molecular weight that it actually might lead to a false positive result and overestimate toxins in, in, the, in, that, in that solution. So those are the two big challenges. And to help get around these, uh, Manju um, conducted a whole variety of controlled experiments to try to optimize this extraction process. 
So what he did is, it, in the first step, it's sort of the, the, the easy part, is just simply he spiked samples with known concentrations of microcystin LR and microcystin RR. These are two very highly toxic uh, forms of microcystin that are, that are abundant in Lake Erie. And he put them at high, at high concentration doses and low concentration doses. So he had a bunch of samples. And the goal there then is to, to show how robust our techniques are at recovering microcystin LR and RR at both high and low concentrations. And then he tested within each of these other two phases, the extraction phase and the sample cleanup phase, a whole variety of, of, of different steps within those phases. So for example, he, the sonication phase sends high frequency sound waves into the, in, into the sample to break up cells. Um, he's different solvent types there. And then in the sample cleanup phase, he's a whole bunch of filtration columns to try and, and different solvents to try to remove some of these molecules that shouldn't be there that might confuse the mass spec. And so in the end, he created a recipe that is optimized, optimizing our ability to, to measure microcystin LR and RR. I'm not going to show you that recipe, um, but I certainly can uh, make it available uh, a little bit later as part of this talk. Um, but what we ultimately were able to do is develop a method that allowed us to recover microcystin um, from fish tissues with uh, a range between 94 to 98% recovery, depending on if you're looking at microcystin LR or RR with high and low concentration. And this is, these are really good numbers, higher than what's been reported in the literature for others that have tried this with fish. So we've got an ability to not only just recover microcystin LR and RR, but we can also um, Recover, we found the ability to recover a whole variety of other variants of microcystin. So we have eight total kinds of individual variants that we can now um, give numbers to for the state if they gave us, when they give us samples to, to, to measure. So that just brings us now to the second part of the talk, and that's just sort of now the, the application. So if we use this new technique, um, what would we find in walleye and yellow perch that were collected during 2015? And if you just remember from what Rick told us, 2015 was a very big bloom event. So just to kind of reinforce what I just said, if you look at this cyanobacteria bloom severity index from, taken from a, a previous report, the, the yellow bar here is 2015. This is the year we sampled, and you can see this is the highest year on record. So it was a good year to actually try to, to measure microcystins in these fish. We essentially were provided um, walleye and yellow perch from both western and central Lake Erie. And I do want to say that, that the two dots here in the central basin, um, fish are actually collected all over the lake in the central basin. Um, these are just fish processing houses that we actually, anglers come in and we actually get part of the fillets and part of the, the meat from, um, from the uh, from um, the, the fish processing houses there. So there's actually a, a widespread sampling in the central basin, much like what you would see in the west basin here. So we've got a variety of places that were sampled before, during, and after the harmful algal bloom season for both water, um, for water levels of microcystin and fish. And then when we, sorry, advance the slide here. And so when we start to look to see what, what do we see in these fish, the first place we looked was in the livers because um, the, the first place that's going to try to de detoxify and get rid of the algal toxins that if they're in the, in the body uh, is the liver. And so if we find toxins in the liver, it, it's an indication that those fish were living in waters with microcystin or they were consuming prey that had microcystin in them. And when we look at both walleye and yellow perch during the peak season, which are these, these clear white bars or just after the harmful, the peak harmful algal bloom season, what you can see are there are absolutely high concentrations of microcystin in the livers, the non-edible non portion of these fish, um, both in, in both during and after the bloom season. Um, and so as long as you don't eat the liver, you know, so I'm assuming we're calling, nobody's eating the liver of these fish, um, but microcystins are there. So again, this is evidence that these fish are living in the bloom or eating prey that were living in the bloom. The key question though is, can the livers handle these loads and are we seeing any evidence that the, the, the livers can't do that and you're starting to see accumulation of toxins in the fish fillets and the fish muscle. And what we find when we look at walleye and yellow perch is the first thing is that in walleye, the walleye that we looked at, we did not find any microcystins in their tissues. So walleye have a, an ability appears to detoxify and um, the liver 
uh, or detoxify the toxins so they're not making into the muscles. But when we look at yellow perch tissues um, before, during, and after the harmful algal bloom season, so that's pre-peak and post-bloom season, in both the western basin on the left and the central basin on the right, what we see are microcystins actually finding their way into the muscles. Most of the fish had very low concentrations of microcystin, less than two, um, micro, two micrograms per kilogram of fish mass. Um, but there were averages um, in excess of, of eight micrograms per kilogram and, and 11 micrograms per kilogram in the west and central basins, respectively. So there, there, is, mu there's, there is microcystin in the, the kinds of muscle tissues that we might eat. And so that, begins, that begs the question of whether or not are these levels um, exceeding recommended um, uh, allowances or, or recommendations by places like the World Health Organization. So the World Health Organization has um, a limit in terms of how much microcystin we can safely consume on a, in, a, in a given day. And that tolerable daily intake, intake this TDI, is 0 0.04 micrograms of microcystin per kilogram of, of human body mass. And so if we think about that 0.04 micrograms and we take a typical average uh, size uh, person that might be 70 kilograms or 150 pounds, so an average size male, um, that person can consume up to 2.8 micrograms of microcystin LR. This is a most toxic form per day. So we've got some upper limit in terms of what can be consumed safely. And then if we now take our average concentrations that we saw in our yellow perch, at least those ones that had microcystin in it, and we take our maximum concentration from, so it's sort of a conservative measure, the highest level we documented in a single individual, and we run the numbers, what we find is that if you consume a, a typical meal, which might be a, a filet of yellow perch that's a, about a quarter of a pound, and you consume that every day, you would still fall below the recommended total daily intake. So based on these numbers, the risk of consuming yellow perch, even if you consumed a yellow perch every day, would not put you over the um, tolerable daily intake recommendation. And so ultimately, what does this all mean? Uh, well, the first thing it means is that the state now has an ability to measure microcystins in fish. And so we've actually been using these methods to process um, fish that have, that have been provided to us from Lake Erie and Grand Lake St. Mary's, another eutrophic system in Ohio, um, to quantify microcystins in these samples. And so we've actually been is quantifying, using our methods to, to measure fish um, being captured as part of the monitoring programs that the Ohio Department of Health, Ohio EPA, and Ohio D um, Division of Wildlife are, are, um, have, on, have ongoing. The second thing is that based on what we've measured, um, I, the data I presented to you, as well as um, from the samples that I've looked at for the state for Lake Erie and Grand Lake St. Mary's, is that consuming fish that during the cyano, cyano bloom season appears to be safe, especially if you follow the Ohio EPA fish consumption guidelines, which basically recommend not eating one more than one walleye per week, not per day, but per week, and not eating more than two yellow perch meals per week. So if you stay and follow those guidelines, you're generally going to be, um, we think you're going to be safe from um, un undue risk. What I want to recommend, and this kind of goes back to what Rick um, just talked a little bit about, is I want to recommend continued monitoring of microcystins in these fish because um, one thing we do know is that the frequency and the size of these cyanoblooms are, are likely going to continue to increase with continued climate change because of expected changes in flows. We're, we're seeing more rain because of um, especially big rain events in the spring because of climate change. So that's just going to only potentially exacerbate um, the harmful algal bloom problem, accepting the idea that maybe we can cut um, phosphorus loads through land management. Um, and as, as Rick sort of alluded to in the previous presentation, 2015 actually had a low concentration of toxins in the water column, so there may be much more higher, to higher toxic years out there. So that's why continued monitoring is the best way to go, um, and it can help ensure uh, that fish are, are, are really safe to eat during the cyanoboom season. And with that, I want to thank you for your attention, and um, I guess I'm off the hook from here on out. <laughs> Stu, thanks for your time, and again, we appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule, so please go give your keynote address, and, and again, your co-authors in the room will be able to field questions uh, later, later in this webinar. All right, Thank much you, appreciate Stu. it. Yep, take it easy. Bye.
Now we'll move on. Um, why don't we go to is Greg Labarge, you, uh, you on and ready to go? Greg, you're still muted. I think I'm off mute now. We've got you, Greg. This is fantastic. So, so Greg's here to talk to us, as you can see from the title, Implementing Best Management Practices on Western Lake Erie Basin Farms. So again, just to show you, yes, we have a bloom value that we're anticipating being around a 7.5, but we want to really illustrate all the great efforts and work that are going on on our agricultural fields to, to decrease these loads of nutrients. So, so Greg, we'll turn it over to you, sir. Yeah, and I think from an agricultural perspective, we know that there's not one single source that is um, related to the issues of phosphorus leaving our field sites here in Northwest Ohio. So we're really approaching this with a variety of different uh, angles to it, uh, hoping that and looking towards uh, best practices that are going to improve water quality while we still uh, look at an increased crop production potential um, out in Northwest Ohio. Um, want to share with you then kind of three main areas and several subtopics underneath of those. Uh, first, uh, want to talk a little bit about some of our research on water quality and crop production that uh, start to get at uh, better management that can um, lead to lower uh, levels of phosphorus in the soil and thus less that is there for movement when we have these rainfall events. Uh, second thing, share a little bit about some of the outreach that's going on. And then finally, just a reminder of a couple of regulations that are already in place, uh, uh, particularly for those in the ag sector to have on the top of their mind as we uh, do production practices in Northwest Ohio. So these are kind of the uh, several topics that I want to look at under those three main areas. I uh, want to talk a little bit about edge of field research, uh, work that's going on in a P-risk index revision that uh, will help us identify some higher yielding fields as far as phosphorus is concerned. We're also looking at nutrient recommendations, uh, better practices for manure application, uh, trying to gauge farmer attitudes uh, through survey work, and then uh, tying that back into some modeling that's gone on in the Northwest Ohio area. So starting with the edge of field studies, we do have uh, 20 different uh, locations, which involves 40 field sites uh, in mo primarily the uh, Western Lake Erie Basin area, also Grand Lake St. Mary's, and just a couple that are outside of that area. It does encompass the tile um, area of the state of Ohio, where we do have a, an, an increasing abundance of tile per acre, and uh, you can see those percentages listed there. I think, um, and just to point out here, we're monitoring not only the surface water that's leaving the site, but also monitoring the water that's coming through that tile system. So we're gauging really all of the phosphorus that's leaving the site through those two different pathways uh, that we see as far as loss. Um, these are the kind of results that we're getting in relationship to phosphorus. Uh, Primarily, the load comes out as DRP when we talk about the, uh, both the surface and subsurface. And uh, as you look at the number of field sites that are listed here, um, that 40 or the red line um, that is in the graphic is um, substantial in that it does represent a division over the acres in the Western Lake Erie Basin and kind of a, a target uh, level um, based off of that 40% reduction. And uh, you do see where we have a variety of sites that meet that type of level so that we know there are practices and field situations that are low yielding in relationship to um, phosphorus loss. Uh, then we also see where we do have a couple of three field situations that are much higher than what that level is. Uh, not that we can have every field meet that target because of different uh, situations that might occur, uh, but we do get to see what both ends of the spectrum look like and start pulling out some characteristics that we can recommend to farmers in relationship to uh, best practices based off of what we see. So this uh, data and this information is really important from the edge of field studies. Uh, that data is being used uh, 
in one way, and that is to look at a P risk index for the state of Ohio, which we already have one in place, but uh, want to have a better representation in particular of that drainage tile and what's coming through that um, in that P risk index. Uh, so we are working on that modification and revision utilizing some of this current data coming from the edge of field studies. Um, so that we can identify those high risk fields without actually having water monitoring equipment on it and then think about uh, getting uh, different practices in place. Uh, when we think about practice implementation, we really have to look at two different things. We have to look at the source, and that is what the source is going on the field, and we can adjust and make changes so that we have a, a lower source of phosphorus in the field. But then we also need to look at transport issues, and that is uh, what are the conditions that lead to higher levels of transport of that material off-site, and that's what this P risk index can help us evaluate. Um, Having the right amount of fertilizer is really important as far as crop production is concerned. Uh, we know that at low levels we will see a, a yield reduction, um, so, and then at uh, levels that are adequate we'll um, not see any of that uh, yield loss yet, but we um, can have excess that would um, in essence put, a, put us at risk in relationship to higher levels of loss off-site. So there is an update of the tri-state fertilizer recommendations, which we use here in the state of Ohio. Um, we anticipate the field work being completed this summer, um, 2017, and those recommendations being revised and uh, released in 2018. Uh, another thing that's happening is a change in manure management practices. Uh, it opens up a, a new window for us and better utilizes nutrients when we actually make in-crop applications of manure. Um, we're doing that uh, in primarily our corn and wheat crop. Uh, those two crops utilize nitrogen that is available from that manure. And uh, at the rates that we match the nitrogen rate to the need for the crop, we're actually seeing that balance out for a two-year crop rotation of a corn-soybean rotation for the phosphorus need of the rotation. Uh, so that side dressing uh, and top dressing of those two crops uh, does a great deal to change the economics of nutrient use for those two crops. And it allows us some more dollars in the crop budget to think about moving that manure further distances uh, to take a better advantage of that manure and uh, put it in places where we can see the greatest benefit. Um, survey work, uh, we've actually had two or three different surveys that have been done in the Western Lake Erie Basin, help us understand the beliefs of farmers, uh, some of the barriers that they see to um, adoption of the best management practices we're talking about, and uh, measure their willingness to change and what things we might be able to do to adjust that willingness to change. So uh, the work that's going on in relationship to understanding farmers and their decision-making process is helping us uh, better better uh, inform policy and um, make uh, changes to the way we approach how we approach farmers in relationship to best management practices so that we hit the right chord and decrease the amount of time it takes to uh, really fully implement some of these best management practices over a wide area. And uh, those best management practices are being measured in relationship to um, targets and different practices. Uh, uh, the red line here again is significant and that it uh, gets us to that uh, level that we're looking at of a 40 percent reduction and uh, we do see that uh, one of the opportunities to reach that level is through 100 percent nutrient management adoption in the Western Lake Erie Basin. Um, that level has some margin of error around it that we have to be concerned about but um, certainly that's one practice that we're um, working in relationship to uh, educating farmers on in the Western Lake Erie Basin. And uh, we'll talk about outreach next. Uh, that ties directly into what we were just referring to as far as uh, widespread adoption of good nutrient management gets us a long way towards meeting that 40% goal. 
And uh, one thing that uh, did happen was the passage of Senate Bill 150 back in 2014 that established the Fertilizer Applicator Certification Training Program in the state of Ohio. Uh, that is for farms that are 50 or more acres in agricultural production. The Ohio Department of Agriculture is the issuing authority there and OSU Extension delivers the education. As of uh, April of this 2017 year, we've trained 16,472 participants uh, towards that fertilizer application certification program. And just so you can see that map just a little bit closer, Next slide here has a kind of a breakdown we do have by county and the darker the uh, brown is that you see on the map, uh, the higher the number of participants that have uh, reached that certification in their county. And you can see that the Western Lake Erie Basin is pretty well covered in relationship to the nutrient or, uh, the participation from certified applicators uh, now here in the state of Ohio. Uh, that fact training content uh, really does hit upon two main issues, and it is the water quality impacts of nutrients, helping farmers understand what is happening in relationship to nutrients that are leaving uh, their field sites. And uh, then we talk about the 4 our nutrient stewardship of correctly using fertilizer and using it in a more effective and efficient fashion from a crop production standpoint. Um, the work that's going on there, we do survey those that are participating in the training and uh, we do see that uh, they get the message of uh, farm phosphorus uh, does have a significant relationship to water quality problems. Uh, we also see where they are taking the training and taking it back home and using it, 82% um, uh, walking away with uh, uh, the message that they want to take a look at their soil test results that they have and compare that to what their current phosphorus management is on their farming operation. Uh, we also have a, a website that has been launched recently, um, has a lot of content trying to um, help farmers and those that advise farmers understand what some of the critical concerns are out in the field that they need to be looking for. Uh, not all of the information or all the field situations that are problematic require a phosphorus index or something to uh, do a calculation to say that that's a problem. Uh, some things are very visual. Uh, some things such as erosion are very visual. Um, taking a look at a soil test and seeing a soil test in, ex in excess of 100 parts per million uh, gives us some field situations that uh, we want to identify as potentially higher yielding um, as far as water leaving those fields at a, in an excessive amount of phosphorus level in them and uh, then we need to think about best management practices that we can apply back on those fields. Um, finally on the reg regulation side uh, we, we talked uh, about the fertilizer um, applicator law that is a statewide certification program for all the state of Ohio. Um, in 2015, it was extended to those that take manure from uh, concentrated animal feeding operations here in the state of Ohio. So all of those uh, per types of farms uh, do need to have that fertilizer certified certification taken care of and the date for that is uh, September 30th of 2017 so coming up here in just a short period of time and then there also is uh, for the Western Lake Erie Basin fertilizer manure application criteria that uh, applies to both granular fertilizer and manure basically defines frozen snow covered soil or uh, the weather conditions, in particular precipitation, either 12 or 24 hours after application, if it's at a certain predicted level, then the um, application is not to be made based off of that forecast. So uh, a variety of things that we're applying here in the state of Ohio related to farmers and um, having them better understand and look at better management so that we can 
really try and approach this topic, which once again, we don't have a, a single source that we can go after. It's multiple different um, sources and ways that uh, phosphorus from fields can get into water, uh, but uh, farmers uh, generally are looking for the best way to keep it on the land because they paid for it, and then they also don't like the uh, black eye that happens when we have these uh, algal blooms in western Lake Erie Basin. And that is all I had for you. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Greg. <clears throat> all right. The next presentation that we're going to move on to is coming to us from a, a faculty member at the University of Toledo. So we have Jason uh, Huntley joining us. And he's going to be giving you insight into one of the, the many things that are, that are going on right now relative to how we can optimize water treatment. Um, uh, so let's see if we can pull that one up. Jason, uh, if you're on, can you unmute yourself? Seem to be called in. Are we, Jill? Are we seeing him as a participant and not a call in? He's not on the phone. Okay, Jason, if you're hearing us, can you uh, call in? A little bit of a delay here, y'all. We'll get going here in a second. We see you in the panelist section. We're just waiting for a call in, Jason. Okay, we're one second. We just got a little bit of technical difficulty here. We'll get a call in one second if you could uh, hang on for us. But to keep us on time because we want to make sure we have enough time for questions, we're going to actually roll over uh, to Melinda Huntley, who comes to us from the Ohio Travel Association, and, and she's going to be talking a little bit more about what you've heard from some of the previous speakers, uh, the idea that, you know, we, we need to still consider Lake Erie a, an asset for the state, and despite, again, some of the numbers that are coming from the forecast for this year, um, this is still a great place to recreate. So, Melinda, you, you ready to go for us? Mm -hmm. Melinda's actually here with us at Stone Lab, so she'll be... Uh, live for us. Left click when you want to left click to resume. Okay. All right, great. And just in case you're wondering, there is no relationship with Jason Huntley or else I would have <laughs> texted him already and told him to get here. Um, but I want to thank all of you and uh, for everyone who was on the call. Um, I'm sure everyone else in this room joins me in saying we wish y'all were here because um, I'm going to do something a little different. Uh, the photos you're going to see, uh, we're not going to you know, show a lot of facts and figures. Um, what I'm going to show you is what I took today. This is what Lake Erie looks like, right? So I would first of all like to thank all of the scientists, the researchers, the elected officials, and others who have dedicated their time, their talents, and, and the resources to keeping our lake beautiful and healthy. You know, what you heard today is a forecast, a, a projection. And as Dr. Stump said, 
Um, it's important to understand that algal blooms are dynamic and ever-changing. In fact, I think his quote was, you know, it depends on how the wind blows, right? And so that is what will happen. That is what will dictate uh, where the blooms may go and whether or not they even reach um, you know, beach areas or impact recreation. A bloom may be isolated to one area of the lake and not impact many other areas. Um, we've heard that said as well. Or they may appear offshore and never really you know, impact the beaches. Dr. Stumps said himself uh, this morning, plenty of areas of, lake, of the lake will not see a bloom even this year. And even a bad year, like 2013, the worst of the blooms didn't include the entire lake. In fact, um, there wasn't any that actually reached the island. All right, so I think it's very important that we understand um, how dynamic these are and also the importance of um, really exploring and understanding where they are, right? So here's my advice. If a bloom is reported and you're planning a visit, particularly if you're concerned um, that it's gonna directly impact your experience or your plans because you're heading to a beach, right? Or you're heading to specifically uh, experience the water, call ahead. It's as simple as that. And remember that conditions can change very quickly. So we certainly don't recommend calling two, three weeks ahead of time, right? And saying, oh, I'm gonna cancel my plans because guess what, two, three weeks later, it could be entirely different. So don't jump to conclusions. You've you know, heard a lot of science, and as I said before, you've heard a lot of facts and figures. And you know, what I decided to do, I talked, thought about, let's do a PowerPoint, let's do all the slides, let's do the facts, let's do the figures, but you know what, uh, what I wanted to do instead was show you what I saw today. Um, and recognize it was rainy and it was cloudy this morning. Um, so we still were able to capture some of these photos as well as some photos, I think there's two in here, that were actually taken yesterday uh, during a fishing event. Because truly, isn't this why all of us are in this room or on the call today? It's because we care about this lake. Lake Erie is one of Ohio's most precious assets for the environment and for the economy. It represents 21% of the planet's freshwater, 21%, and it's right outside our door. All along the shoreline, we are awakening to its possibilities. As communities begin to understand the significance and the business opportunities the lake and its access create for economic development and a truly, truly remarkable quality of life. To calculate the economic impact of this problem, if this problem isn't corrected immediately, is, is really immeasurable. For how does one truly measure the cost of lost opportunities? Those ideas not even yet envisioned. But what we do know is this. Lake Erie provides drinking water for about 11 million people. It's used to ship commodities. It supports a strong commercial fishing industry, as well as a $2.9 billion sport fishing industry in Ohio alone. Dozens of water-related companies operate and employ Ohioans because of the lake. A $4 billion recreational boating industry employs more than 26,000 Ohioans. And what's interesting is this demand for some of these outdoor recreation is only growing. More and more people want to experience the outdoors. Uh, while Ohio population grew about a mm, little less than 1% in 2015, registrations for uh, boats actually increased 10%. So we're starting to see some of these trends happening. People are demanding you know, more recreational, more outdoor ac activities. And those of us who visit the lake not only support more than 123,000 jobs and produce more than $14 billion in economic activity, but we also discover that the quality of life available along our shores is amazing, and it might draw us to make it our home as well. In fact, a recent study shows that those who visit 
uh, the Western Basin region are 150% more likely to view this region as a good place to start a business if they've been here before. The International Joint Commission projected recently nearly a $71 million loss in economic benefits from the 2011 algal bloom and an additional $65 million loss in 2014. These are conservative figures and they included losses in property values, losses in recreational spending, and costs, costs for municipalities. All that can be reduced or eliminated in the future if we act now to prevent future blooms. But as astronomical as these figures are, they don't even begin to address the incalculable. As our primary concern is protecting our guests, it's protecting our employees, it's protecting our families, it's protecting our livelihood, and it's protecting our way of life. Why do you care about the lake, right? Why are you on the call today? Why are you in this room? Dr. Stump said if we stop phosphorus from entering Lake Erie, the blooms will end. And as we've heard, and we've heard from several people, the causes are all multifaceted. So perhaps two are the solutions. And maybe we really need to be creative. And all of us, all of us take part in creating some of those solutions. Because quite frankly, each and every one of us on the call and in the room should be doing all we can to protect the, this asset, Lake Erie, that's under our watch. For when we talk about protecting Lake Erie, we often say we're doing so to make it better for future generations. What will it say about our generation if we don't do something about it now? Thank you. Thank you, Melinda. Looks like uh, we're optimistic here. We think we've resolved our audio issue. So, uh, Jason, if you could unmute you. Hold on. Um, Unmute you. Can you speak? See if we can get you through the, the phone here. Jill, can you try unmuting him? We're working on Jason. We see you in the presenter panel. Hello? There. Can you hear me? Not you now, Jason. Ah, I guess the phone from Colorado to Ohio, it's just too far. <laughs> All right. You should have access to the PowerPoint. You're now the presenter, so you should be able to rest the slides and, and use your mouse pad as a, as a pointer. So go right okay. ahead, Jason. Thank okay, you. great. Sorry again about the delay before. So, uh, yeah, I'd like to talk about today some work we're doing to isolate bacteria that can degrade the microcystin toxin. Um, and let me see here. All right, so this is just to remind you this is not unique to Lake Erie. You know, they have blooms in China, France, uh, here in the U.S. We've had them in uh, Florida, San Francisco, uh, and Australia. So this is a, a worldwide problem, not just Toledo. So there are reasons to think more globally about this, and you know, not just like Erie, of course. Uh, so the rationale for our study really comes uh, from this, uh, which is, uh, as you know, there are bacteria that produce the toxin, uh, but if you look at that toxin, and I'm trying to keep this very simple, right, for those of you who are non-scientists, it's basically seven amino acids in a cyclic structure. So again, while there are bacteria, the microcystis that produce that toxin, we also think that there are bacteria that could use this toxin as an energy source. Uh, so I'm sorry, it's not showing up. Uh, anyway, because it is basically seven modified amino acids, we think that there are bacteria in Lake Erie that could use that as an energy source. So we developed a process or kind of an experimental plan uh, to isolate those bacteria. Uh, now this is not novel because it's actually been shown in both Australia uh, and in China that there are microsystem degrading bacteria that are present in lakes where there are really large harmful algal blooms. Um, but I hope you can appreciate both of those countries are far away from the U.S. and quite different than Lake Erie. Um, so we weren't sure if that was possible or if the degradation process is even the same. So this will just show you in 2014, 2016, 2017, we, or, well, we haven't done it yet, but we will this summer, uh, we collect uh, Lake Erie samples um, from all over the western basin of Lake Erie. This is just to remind you though that there's two different types of bacteria that do produce microcystin or MCLR. Microcystins dominate um, kind of closer to Toledo and then Planktothrix tend to dominate down by Sandusky Bay. 
So again, we're collecting from these different areas because we think that the bacterial communities in Lake Erie and those different parts of Lake Erie could be quite different. So here on this next slide, this is basically how we do this. Um, I guess the simple analogy is, uh, for everyone listening, suppose I put you all in an auditorium and lock the doors. And for two weeks, the only thing I gave you to eat was crickets. Some of you would probably die. You know, you just couldn't force yourself to eat crickets. However, there's a certain percentage of you that eventually would just suck it up and eat crickets and live. And at the end of that two weeks, I would open the door and see who's still there and manage to eat crickets and survive. That's essentially what we do in our projects. So we take Lake Erie water samples. We only give them microcystin toxin over and over and over again for four, five, six weeks. So we're forcing the bacteria that can't use microcystin as an energy source to die. But those that can, we can then isolate those and purify those. And again, our ultimate goal is to identify those bacteria and use them in these uh, biofilters. So we know that the city of Toledo water treatment plant uses sand filters. We know that those are not sterile. They're actually somewhat biologically active. There's different things that grow in there and kind of help keep our water clean. So our ultimate goal is to give these degrading bacteria to the city of Toledo water treatment plant and other water treatment plants along Lake Erie to degrade the microcystin toxin. This is to keep the water safe um, because they, you know, they currently use chlorine. Uh, they use other things to help remove the toxin. And they also use uh, activated charcoal, which has to be disposed of, and it costs a lot of money. So what if we use something that was already in the lake to remove the toxin? That's our ultimate goal here. So let me just show you, I mean, I don't think you have to be a microbiologist to understand. Uh, I'm showing you here the plate on the left. Um, you can see that there's small white colonies. This is, this is the lake water sample we got uh, in 2014. So pretty much all the bacteria are the same. After four weeks of just giving them toxin nonstop, you can see the plate on the right, how different those bacteria are. Right? They, gone, they went from small white to pink and yellow and large colonies. Uh, some of these kind of look like fried eggs. So this indicates to us that the selection process is actually working. Okay, so the next question is, can they actually degrade? So I'm showing you here on the top, on the left, that if we just put microcystin, the purified toxin, in water, as you heard before, it's very, very stable, right? So we had 50 parts per billion approximately. Um, there is a little bit of variation here based on that ELISA test that's used to detect it, but it's very stable in water. Um, and then I'm sorry the animation doesn't work on the bottom, but the take-home message is, let me walk you through this, this kind of bottom graph. So we have these Lake Erie water samples that we spike with microcystin for four or six weeks or longer. So the blue arrows are every time we add microcystin, about 25 parts per billion. So we sample then and we sample two to three days later. So every blue arrow indicates when we spike with microcystin. So again, if you look at the top left, you see in theory, if we would keep adding microcystin, the concentration would go up, 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 and it would actually, uh, I'm showing you here, the total we added was 550 parts per billion. But I hope you can appreciate in, when we do this selection process, the bacteria that we're actually isolating can degrade the toxin down to almost undetectable levels, right? I, I hope you can see that. So if we add this all up, our bacteria that we've isolated from Lake Erie can degrade about 13 to 14 parts per billion per day. And the total degradation during just this experiment, about 40 days, is 550 parts per billion. So that's really, really good uh, degradation. And we think that could be realistically used in the City of Toledo Water Treatment Plan. Uh, the only thing to take home from this other than that is there are two different tests here. In red is the, is the ELISA test that's commonly used uh, by the City of Toledo Water Treatment Plant right now. In blue is something we're working with Dragan Asilovich at University of Toledo. Uh, you heard Stu talk about mass spec. This is a very sensitive uh, kind of chemistry-based uh, detection. And the take-home message here is that those two different tests give very similar results. Okay, so hopefully you can see that on the next slide that I showed you these colonies that actually can degrade microcystin. We're now separating that, those out to try to look if we can get degradation by individual bacteria. And that's shown here on the next slide. We also want to see if they're safe or not. So we've been sequencing these to make sure that, that they're not human pathogens. I can tell you from all those that we've sequenced thus far, none of those are associated with human disease or been reported to cause human disease. So we're pretty confident if we use this as a biofilter, this will not lead to human disease. And again, I want to uh, really highlight the fact that if you turn on your tap water at home, 
it, it's not sterile, right? There's plenty of bacteria in the water. So we're just adding back something which is naturally occurring anyway, and these are not uh, bacteria that would cause disease in humans. So what happens if we look at individual bacteria, not groups, but individual can degrade? It's the same kind of setup. The blue arrows show you where when we add the toxin, and then uh, we sample a couple days later. And again, I've kind of put here in red. I hope you can appreciate over the course of this whole experiment, these individual bacteria are degrading about 12 parts per billion per day. So again, this correlates with what we actually saw even during the worst scenario of 2014. So we think our bacteria can do a really good job of degrading microcystin. And this is just showing you here on the next slide that even groups of bacteria, five or so together, do even a better job. Um, so, uh, however, this gets a little more complicated and uh, I don't want to get into a whole bunch of technical aspects of what we're doing, but in this particular case, I'm showing you with the blue arrows when we add microcystin. But the top line uh, is when we measure toxin by ELISA. The bottom line is when we measure it by mass spec. So in this particular case, these groups of five bacteria, for whatever reason, they're actually degrading the toxin, but you can't detect degradation by the ELISA test, only when we use that really specific mass spectrometry test. So I mean, this tells us in the future that uh, we may need to look um, at different methods to test whether or not that toxin is actually degraded. Um, so again, our ultimate goal is to use these bacteria to make a biofilm. This next slide is just to show you that in fact they do form biofilms. Again, you don't have to be a scientist, but uh, the take home message here is the more purple color you see, the better those bacteria are able to adhere to or stick to glass. Uh, these are siliconized glass tubes, um, so silica is what sand is made of. So you can see here on the right how these groups of bacteria really stick well to glass. And I've shown you on a graph how well they stick. Um, this uh, red line is basically our benchmark for the minimum amount of biofilm formation we want in a biofilter. So all the bacteria that we're looking that degrade toxin also stick to, to sand or to silica. Okay, and then we're also in the process of moving this forward into actual lab scale biofilters. So um, this just shows you we have that cloudy kind of solution here on the left. Those are the bacteria. Uh, if I zoomed in, you'd be able to see that they're actually sticking to the sand. We then flow contaminated water through this, microcystin containing water, and we collect samples here on the bottom and see how good our bacteria can degrade and how quick they do it. So this is a experiment in progress. We're still working on that. Um, but again, I hope you can appreciate now that this is working and we're working on sand filters, um, we're testing different variants too, not just LR, but LA and RR. And our ultimate goal is to uh, either develop biofilters or to identify the enzymes that degrade microcystins. We can develop droplets or tablets that could be used uh, in the water or for point of source treatment. So all this wasn't possible without funding from Ohio Sea Grant, uh, the Ohio Department of Higher Education. So we're really happy to get that funding. Hope to continue all this work in the future. We have great collaborators. Tom Bridgman got his water samples from Lake Erie. Uh, George Bullerzon um, and Mike McKay at Bowling Green have helped us get water samples as well. Uh, in general, we've had great collaborators all over the state, including at the University of Toledo. And then Allison Brandle is a student who's been working on this project, and she's really worked hard on that. Um, so that's it. Thanks. Great. Thank you, Jason. And as we're looking at this last slide from Jason, it really shows you that the collaboration that's happening across many universities, but also the funding sources that are available in Ohio and around the Lake Erie um, watershed to, to really do some of this work. So I, I know that Greg Labarge is still on and unmuted, and, and so is Jason Huntley. Um, Melinda Huntley is sitting in the room with us, and I know that Jay Martin um, is sitting in the back of the room, and he can field questions on behalf of Stu Ludson being one of the co-collaborators on, on that project. Um, so people in the audience will also take questions from you, but I know that uh, Jill Gentis from the communications team is going to kind of relay some questions to us up here um, for the, the scientists that presented to answer. But again, here, here at uh, Stone Lab, we have a lot of the content experts sitting in the room right now. We have folks from um, NOAA here, of course, from uh, Ohio Sea Grant and Ohio State, um, Limnotech presence here in the room. Um, so we've got a lot of scientists hanging out here, Kent State University represented. So hopefully we can answer the questions that come across the line. Okay, so we'll take one here from the from the classroom as we organize our online questions. Is there anybody from somebody sitting here in the room that we have? No questions here. Jason, I'll have one since we're, we're there's not one right now in the room. 
So the last bullet you made on your last slide, you were mentioning this idea of biofilms, but then also this droplet or pill. Can you elaborate a little bit more on what you're talking about with, with the enzymes? Yeah, so uh, I hope, hopefully you can still hear me. Uh, again, in Australia and China, they know the degradation process. Um, there's specific enzymes. We've looked for those enzymes in our degrading bacteria, and as I mentioned, obviously Ohio and Lake Erie are farther, much, much farther away from China and Australia. So we've looked for those degrading enzymes that have been published on. They're not present in Lake Erie. So we're looking for those enzymes. Uh, again, now that we have the bacteria that degrade the toxin, we have ways to purify and isolate those enzymes. And then, all, you know, other than the biofilter, which could be used in large water treatment plants, um, these drops or tablets could be used point of source. You're out on the boat and you need to quickly detoxify water, or you're camping somewhere. Um, you know, maybe you have a lake house and you know you're pulling directly from the lake. Anyway, this would be point of source treatment. So I, I hope that explains that. Absolutely. No, I, I think just for the, I think the scientists in the audience maybe grab that. It's the idea for the, for the layman maybe when you say bacteria degrade, they do it by a process of, of using enzymes. And so if you can identify that enzyme, then you don't have to have the bacteria present. You can actually have the enzyme to do the degradation. Right. And that would probably make the public much more, uh, they'd be less leery of us, you know, uh, there might be some concern, again, that we're putting things into the water treatment process. Some people might be, might be uneasy with that. However, if we have the purified enzyme, right, you use enzymes for all kinds of things. Thank you, Jason. We've got a question from uh, online. Jill, go ahead. Uh, Rick, I have quite a few questions for you and Laura. Uh, first question uh, for Rick, um, could you, will you uh, give a final forecast when you have all the data through July 31st? Uh, the the data we have now should pretty well set the forecast. If we get to the end of July, it becomes too late to drive the bloom for this year. And any the changes now, we have so much of the load in now that we're looking at what would be even with some of this rain, which most of which might have been outside the Maumee Basin, if we're talking about a few percent. So we, we don't expect a change that would be, if we updated it, you wouldn't notice it on the graphic. Another question that we had gotten in the audience was, um, why did, and this could be several of you, uh, why did a much larger algal bloom in 2015 not generate the water crisis that occurred in 2014? Short answer is everyone was better prepared. That's, uh, there were, the monitoring systems uh, were Better. We are providing more data from our side. Um, the various water treatment plants had monitoring. They, Toledo was working with Limnotech. I see John Bratton in the back of the room. Um, I don't know if you add, you've got a pretty comprehensive instrumentation. Do you have something you'd want to add to that? Because that's an important part too. They know before it, they actually pull in the water what's going on. So there's a whole reason, a collection of reasons why there's not a reason. The bloom wasn't as toxic. As well, wasn't right? as toxic, yes. Uh, Laura, could you uh, talk a, a little bit about what management strategies have been implemented by farmers in an effort to reduce phosphorus losses from fields during rain events in the Maumee watershed? We've gotten quite a few questions dealing with agricultural community. Sure. Yeah. Um, I'll come up here. Yeah. So uh, the, I, I guess the, the biggest practices, um, well, early on they all focused on uh, keeping soil on the fields, and so a lot of these practices were you know, conservation tillage, rotational no-till, filter strips, those types of things. Now that we realize that dissolved phosphorus is more of a concern than probably we were giving it credit for before, um, that these focuses are switching to uh, nutrient management, making sure the appropriate amount of fertilizer is being put on at the right place and the right timing. Uh, there's a lot of regulations that are now surrounding um, putting fertilizers on not before rain events like Greg LeBarge just showed and not on frozen ground. So you know, those types of, of things are those that help. Uh, there's been a big push also to implement uh, cover crops that should improve soil health and help soils hold on to water um, and hopefully maybe trap some of those nutrients in the off season as well. And then finally drainage water management's a big, there's a big push for that. I don't think that there's been a whole lot of that implemented by places where it is, and the science that goes behind it has shown that there can be some 
um, substantial reductions in phosphorus loading simply because there's not as much water running off of the field, not necessarily because there's a big change in, in phosphorus concentration. Does that Gre cover everything? Greg Labarge, do you have any other additional comments that you wanted to make to add on to what, what Laura gave? Yeah, I, I think the only other thing that uh, Laura did not mention is uh, the uh, tile risers that exist in fields that are direct conduits to the tile system thus really are moving surface water. Um, there are places that uh, those are being replaced with what's called a blind inlet that provides some filtering through soil that does reduce the concentration of phosphorus leaving the site. Uh, so in, in addition to all the things that Laura mentioned there, that would be an additional one that's being focused on. So whereas it's fairly clear that we have a good idea of what practices we need to implement, um, I would say that our data is fairly obvious that not enough of that's been implemented yet and there's still, still room to move on that one. And, and the efficacy of each one of those practices varies depending on the field type that you're on. So there's still a lot of data that needs to be collected. And in addition to the, you know, the paired sites that you had mentioned, your edge of field parasites, Greg, there, there are you know, a good number of demo farms that are showing up across the state too that are showing these practices in place. So if you're curious about what a blind inlet looks, there's a lot of opportunities to see that kind of in, in, in action. Uh, another question that we had, sorry, um, I'm interested in your thoughts on the future ability to compare newer, more accurate satellite data with older, less accurate imagery to understand future blooms compared to the target 2008 bloom year under future nutrient reduction. We've already done that when we went from Maris to MODIS, because we'd started with the Maris data set. We did a, a, a cross-validation of those two, and we're continuing that. So 2008 is actually Maris data, which is essentially the same as Ulchi. Well, that makes that one really easy. Uh, it's the 13 through 16 blooms are MODIS, but we are doing a cross-match of MODIS to Ulchi to make sure that we're going to get a consistent result. At this point, our preliminary results show they're still matching. So we're, we've already covered that in the past, and we're going to make sure that we do have a continuity so that the MODIS record aligns correctly across Maris and Ulchi. Rick, this is a question for you. Um, recent estimates of internal loading are less than 10%. Does your work agree? Yes. All right. <laughs> there you go. I've never heard a scientist answer that abruptly. <laughs> uh, what is, this is another one for, for Rick. What is the major mechanism behind wind influence algal distribu distribution in the western basin? Is there any observation of upwelling in this part of the lake? Uh, uh, in the western basin, you would have a hard time getting upwelling just because it's so shallow. It'll tend to mix, and um, the short answer is the wind pushes the water around, and the water carries the bloom. That's pretty well how it works. So, but the uh, central basin, you can get, you can get upwelling, upwelling and you, little algal blooms from that. Yeah, you can get upwelling in the central basin. There's also what's called the thermal bar, which blocks the near shore off from the deep water. And so you can get these near shore blooms that are not related to the central basin, but related to local tributaries, concentrating nutrients that can produce those those blooms. But yeah, so there's upwelling in the central basin, western basin. No, it's pretty much when the wind blows, it mixes top to bottom, and you don't get to get upwelling. You need stratified water, and that as soon as the wind blows, the stratification breaks down in the western basin. I'm looking for like our panel of limnologists. They left us, and so I can't. <laughs> I'm looking at Justin, Karen, um, Doug. The year with the Toledo water crisis, it was an, a northerly wind that that pushed down the water and concentrated it, and uh, that was one of the implicated mechanisms. Yeah, you you yeah. will get weak transport, but upwelling in a in a typical context of pulling up deep water is not. Yeah, there's no deep. Water yeah. <laughs> so the comment that you're hearing, Kate, that's uh, Dr. Payne from Defiance, basically saying in the traditional phrasing of what upwelling is, no, but you're going to get mixing due to winds that would come maybe from the northeast and you know, stir the stir the western basin water. Have there been any improvements in understanding why and what prompts the cyanobacteria to produce microcystin? So we do, uh, Tim Davis was here also from NOAA Glarel. Uh, 
Justin, can you speak? So I'm Justin Chaffin from Ohio Sea Grants coming up and can address that question. So we, there's a couple of theories why this kind of bacteria produces the toxin microcystin, but no definitive answer. One suggestion then um, is that it is it helps aid in oxidative stress. So um, in, in highlight environments where the cyanobacteria like to float, they like to be floating near the surface, dissolved organic matter breaks down into reactive oxygen species, and microcystin can help aid uh, defense against those reactive oxygen species. So it's kind of like an antioxidant. Thank you, Justin. We're going to give about two more from, um, from online, but we had a, a lot of questions come in. So what we will do is we'll pull a document together and send it to our experts and compile, uh, compile some answers to the questions that have come in over the webinar. So uh, a couple more here real quick. Um, Beach managers have asked me how far east in Lake Erie have HABs been detected. Presque Isle. Yeah, Presque Isle. So in uh, 2011, and that was because of the, again, the winds that presented themselves during that year, we had a bloom that was out east of Cleveland towards New York and, and Pennsylvania. Uh, but you will see, if you get upwelling events, you will see pockets of blooms that can sure. occur that are separate from the kind of the traditional movement of the bloom from the west to the east. So. Many factors will vary into that, but we have seen blooms out into Pennsylvania and New York. Yeah, the, the one, 2011 is the one case for the Western Basin bloom. The other is in some years there's a short-lived bloom in mid-July, and in some years that um, there's been once or twice when that has come up on the Ohio coast. There was another year where it came up on the Ontario coast. That only lasts two weeks. It has nothing to do with the Western Basin. And then there are also local ones. So Presque Isle has had some local blooms that have nothing to do with the Western Basin. So um, again, that constraining of it. So kind of different. It depends on how you're phrasing the question as to what the answer is. Uh, could Justin comment on blooms recently in the Central Basin and how much you are currently seeing in the Western Basin? So the blooms we see in the central basin are a complete, completely different type of cyanobacteria. Um, in, in the western basin, we have microcystis. Uh, we know that the microcystis biomass is highly correlated to the Maumee River phosphorus loadings. In the central basin, um, uh, um, it used to be called anabena. It's now called Deluxe Spermum, and we don't really know why the blooms occur out there. We know that the blooms generally occur early to mid-July. They're on a much lower lower biomass scale than the western basin blooms. And we're, we're also learning that the, the central basin blooms are not producing toxins. They're not producing microcystins, and they're not producing any other cyanobacteria toxins. Great. Thanks, Justin. Um, we're going to pause it there, and as I said, we'll compile the questions that came in over the webinar, and we'll circulate through the through the experts that are in, in the audience and those that I know that are online, and we'll try and get you some answers out to that. We'll post that document where the webinar is recorded and will be posted on our website. I wanted to bring one other thing up before we, um, if I can find that. Oh, good call here. Uh, just wanted to point out a couple things from a from a, just a, an announcement point of view from Ohio Sea Grant Stone Lab. Uh, this was a slide that I used earlier for the press conference, but I did want to talk about some research re research findings. So the fourth bullet down, um, that Ohio Department of Higher Education funding that was mentioned earlier, co-managed by Ohio Sea Grant, OSU, and University of Toledo. Um, there's been three years of work already conducted, uh, and we have a report out that left on Tuesday, so it's on the street as of Tuesday, and it highlights. 18 projects, uh, two-year projects that are completed, and another 14 that are about a year through. So please visit Ohio Sea Grant's website and download that report. So again, that's the findings of a, uh, basically three years of work underneath the Ohio Department of Higher Education. Did want to mention future research efforts. So Ohio Sea Grant has their RFP that's already on the street. We are now to the point where we're pulling in full proposals. But please remember that the next round of Ohio Department of Higher Education funding, which is round three, the full proposal, uh, I'm sorry, the pre-proposal deadline for that 
is uh, July 27th. So that's coming up very quickly. And if you've seen the, the governor's biennial budget, we have seen that there will be two more rounds of Ohio Department of Higher Education funding coming for 18 and 19. So there are a lot of opportunities to continue addressing these questions that we're still searching for some answers on. And then there's some upcoming events here, um, but really what I want to highlight, knowing who's on the, uh, the call, uh, is the third sub-bullet. There is a State of the Lake meeting planned for September 14th. It'll be in Toledo at the Stranahan. This is the second annual of this. There was one that occurred last year. Um, we'll have a lot of research presentations at that and also a poster session. Oh, so please check Ohio Sea Grant's website for more information. Uh, we're we're going to do an announcement and a place to RSVP. Um, it'll be up uh, hopefully late this week or early next week. So please use Ohio Sea Grant's website to look at, at that event. Um, with that, I want to thank everybody for taking time out of your day um, to listen to the webinar. Um, and everybody have, it's not quite the weekend yet, but this is the last time I'll chat with all of you, so have a good weekend, everybody. Thanks.